Okay, so I'm Judy Clavens Junta. I work at the Red Bank Public Library as a library assistant. And so, as you know from the flyer that I sent around, um, we're going to be talking about coffee night, the history of it, the social history of it, um, origins of it. And then, um, after I speak, um, Eric from Coffee Corral in Red Bank, and I know some of you might not be from Red Bank, will be talking about uh, hosting and growing and all those other things. Um, after each segment, I'm going to ask everybody to mute themselves, which I think you all are muted right now. After each segment, you can unmute and ask questions, or you can put questions in the chat box, or you can hold everything to the very end. So um, with that said, I'm going to start with, well, so coffee, uh, which is a caffeine stimulant, um, and actually is the most commonly assumed psychoactive substance in the world, which is, I thought, I found sort of interesting. But let me bring up my... Um, Okay. So there are many origin myths. Um, one that I like the most and it seemed to make the most sense to me because I think a lot of things that have come into our food systems and our food ways were things that were accidentally um, found to be edible or found to be taste good or whatever. So there, that one of the origin myths is that a shepherd in, Ethiop in the Ethiopian forest um, that's the Ethiopian forest <laughs> there. Um, let me just, okay, move, whoops. I just wanted to change that, okay. So he noticed that his sheep, when they ate certain berries, would get uh, very energetic and very excited. And um, so he thought, well, maybe we have something here. So he brought it to some local monks who through a process of elimination figured out a way to roast and, you know, through accidental processes. Uh, roast the beans and make a coffee that was delicious to them. And they, they really, um, they, they liked it a lot. So it began to spread uh, around the Arabian Peninsula. And um, it's spread beyond the Arabian Peninsula as a result of trade, the pilgrims that came to Mecca and European travelers. Um, actual uh, cultivation and trade began in Yemen. So the Arabian Peninsula and the uh, discovery of coffee as a, a drink that everybody liked to eat um, also led to the origin of coffee houses, which were called schools of the wise because people got together, um, drink coffee, conversation, listen to music, watch performers, they shared news. And of course there was all men and um, they became an important center for the exchange of information also. So that's why they became called the School of the Wise. And as I said, with thousands of pilgrims visiting Mecca each year from all over the world, um, as, and also European travelers that, that traveled to the Middle East even then, um, it soon spread uh, or, or the, the knowledge of the drink soon spread. And of course the coffee beans uh, began to be traded. So coffee hit Europe in the middle of the, well, in this early part, early to middle part of the 17th century. Now, an interesting fact is that it was originally taboo and very much mistrusted by the clergy. Not too surprising when you think that coffee has a stimulating effect, you can sort of get a rush from it and they just didn't trust it. And they actually called it um, the invention of Satan or Satan's drink and uh, they condemned it when it first came to Venice in 1615 and then it spread um, throughout Europe, the condemnation until Pope Clement III, Pope Clement III um, lifted the taboo. And from then on, coffee became a thing that everybody, that was acceptable and everybody found it satisfying and it, it had papal, appro papal approval. So anyway, um, so that became, that was the origins of how coffee came to Europe and how it came to be accepted in Europe. Um, let's talk a little bit about morning beverages um, and actually coffee versus spirits. Now, in the beginning, um, in the morning, people would drink um, spirits. They would drink beer, uh, they would drink ale, hard cider, wine. Um, their beer was a lower alcohol content. It also, the fermentation process for these liquors or these hard liquors and spirits actually killed the bacteria in the water, which was a very big deal because water was quite contaminated in those days and a source of a lot of disease and infection. Um, they considered beer to be nutritious, 
safe, healthy, and they also felt it had medicinal values and also it was a source of calories and nutrition for them. Um, so then coffee comes on the scene and they began to switch to coffee as the morning beverage. And it, it had quite an effect on the population. The result was that people began their day more alert and energetic, which of course is no big surprise because we all know that you know, at the end of a long day to calm down and to sort of zone out, we will drink beer, ale, cider, wine, whatever. Um, and we drink our coffee in the morning to get us going. So it became a preferred beverage. And interestingly, and not interestingly, I mean, obvi obviously uh, people's work improved and the bosses all loved it because their work quality improved. And I was thinking that maybe this is the precursor to the modern day office coffee service. Um, I don't know if I'm dating myself. I don't know if it's still around, but it was a time when a building would have a coffee cart that would come around to different floors and, and have coffee and pastries and other stuff like that. But I think it, you'd be hard pressed to find an office anywhere that doesn't have a coffee machine um, in it. So I thought, sort of thought that that was pretty interesting and amusing um, because it switched the whole approach that people had to their day and it gave their day a, a shot in the arm to get started with a lot of energy. So coffee houses and um, I asked Eric to maybe talk a little bit about, I think we've gone for full circle with this because of course, along with the, um, the um, along with coffee arriving in Europe, the idea of coffee houses arrived in Europe. And we're sort of getting back to that now. We're sort of getting back to the whole idea of a coffee house as, as a place to gather and share information and socialize. So, um, so coffee houses began around the same time as uh, coffee was introduced. Supposedly by the end of the 17th century, there were thousands. I have seen in my research data anywhere from 300 to 8,000. So in, I don't know if they were, maybe they were talking about London, England, Europe as per se, but needless to say, by the end of the uh, 17th century, they were quite, they were quite, quite prevalent and, and um, um, everybody really enjoyed them and, and they would go to them. Now, some of the first coffee houses in Oxford were called Penny Universities. Um, the Oxford coffee houses were, needless to say, uh, gathering places for academics and people who went to Oxford, who were teachers at Oxford. And the idea of a Penny University was um, that's more something like what a Penny University might have looked like at the time, is that they were alternative learning sites. And being alternative learning sites, people were able to get spend a penny on a cup of coffee and they would listen to people, professors or stu st students or academics talk about uh, the things they taught or the things they were studying, um, you know, their, 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 as they put it, advances in human knowledge and learn what they would be additional learning sites. I don't think that in those days, um, degrees or things like that were as big of an issue as they were now. Um, just learning was important. Um, and, um, and at the same time, um, they grew into places that, as we said, like-minded individuals, merchants, shippers, brokers, artists, they were very much a similar population in each kind of um, coffee house. And businesses actually grew from social interaction. In fact, coffee houses were the site of a lot of business deals and business uh, arrangements. And to the point where Lloyd's Coffee House was the site for the formation of Lloyd's of London, which still to this day is one of the largest insurance companies in the world. So, um, and also unlike public houses and public houses were places where people drank and they would have a woman's side and a man's side, um, no alcohol was served at all and women were excluded. So while women were allowed in public houses, they were not they were sort of excluded, not sort of, they were excluded from coffee houses in the beginning. So, okay. Now we're gonna talk about the new world, America. Um, coffee came the new world around the same time as it came to Europe. It was brought over by the British who brought it to New Amsterdam. And um, so it grew up, it, it began to be a prevalent drink there and coffee houses grew up there as well. But an interesting side note is that John Smith, who um, was the founder of the colony of Virginia, um, he also just introduced coffee to America, but much earlier um, in 1607, he shared his, um, 
his love of coffee and coffee beans from his travels in Turkey. So I guess this guy was pretty intrepid. I mean, he went to Turkey, then he came to the New World, he started the colony of Virginia. But anyway, uh, needless to say, coffee came to the New World. Um, but reality is that coffee houses existed, but populations still preferred tea, hard cider, and ale, um, because that was what they were more used to in, um, in Europe or in England, at least. So that was until 1773, which probably you don't need to know much history to know what happened in 1773, the famed cry of no taxation without representation and the Boston Tea Party. Um, so the Boston Tea Party took place in 1773 and that was a very big turning point in the history of coffee in, in this country. Um, just a, a few bits of information about that. The, colonists dressed up as Native Americans so that they would not be recognized because had they been recognized, they would have been arrested. Um, they th dumped 340 uh, chests, uh, chests of tea and it was about, let me see, 90,000 pounds, 45 tons, and in today's currency would have been worth a million dollars. So this of course forever changed um, the preferences of Americans for coffee. Um, because it became a patriotic thing to drink coffee versus tea. And how interesting that is that we might have ended up being a tea drinking country instead of a coffee drinking country if things had turned out differently um, in the 1800s. So anyway, so I just wanted to share, before we go into health benefits, um, I just wanted to share some trivia that I picked up that I thought was just interesting facts that people might or might not be interested in. So. Today, over 2.25 billion cups of coffee are consumed in the world every day. That's a lot of coffee. <laughs> and Brazil is the greatest producer of coffee in the world, almost a third of the entire world's coffee, but Eric had, has informed me that it's actually more than that now. So this might be an old fact. 54% um, of Americans, more than half of Americans older, older than 18, drink a cup of coffee every day. Um, coffee, and this is, I thought was pretty phenomenal. It's the second most traded commodity in the world. At least it was. I don't think this, these, are, these facts are, are that old. Um, and the first one is oil. So it's interesting. We're always talking about oil shortages. And so far, we've never talked about coffee shortages. But I wonder how much that would affect the economy if, if indeed also there was a problem with the coffee crop. Maybe Eric could speak more to that. So, um, just so you know, not that anybody would ever drink 100 cups of coffee, but caffeine in, you know, over, you can't overdose on caffeine, but you'd have to drink 100 cups of coffee and it could be lethal. Um, it is, does have an effect on the nervous system. It speeds up the heart rate and um, it causes a, a lot of other, uh, uh, it, it's a diuretic. So it can cause a lot of symptoms if you really overdose on caffeine, but I don't think anybody has to worry about that because I don't know anybody that would drink 100 cups of coffee. Okay, so this I also found amusing is that citizens of New York City um, drink seven, seven times more coffee. Um, oh, I, don't, I thought there was a chat room. Oh, there, somebody's saying uh, on NPR the other day, there was a story about a potential problem with this year's crop, crops due to rainfall. Yeah, and there are a lot of crops actually that are um, that there are problems with. And uh, so coffee might be one of them. And it'll be interesting to see if that is true, if there is a problem with the coffee crop, what's gonna happen? Because you can see from these statistics that coffee is a very big part of our culture and around the world. Um, so citizens of New York City, and they would probably be most affected by this, they consume seven times more coffee than people from any other city in the United States. Um, whoops, whoops, I know there's more. what's going on here. All right, I seem to have, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute. Don't know what happened there, but I seem to have lost. You'll have to bear with me. Um, okay, so hopefully, yeah, there we go, okay. So um, now this is another interesting fact, and this is true of a lot of substances that we eat fruits and vegetables and plant foods for 
antioxidants, um, polyphenols and things like that. A lot of those substances are created by the plant to protect themselves. And they, ha they have the same protective effect on us when we eat them. The coffee plant contains caffeine to attract bees as pollinators. And I think everybody is aware, or if not, you, you, it, you might have heard that there's a lot of problems with a high buy off and they're very concerned about bees because there are major pollinators and without uh, pollination, I, I don't know if, where I got this figure, it might have less, it might be more that 80% of the crops in the world would, would not grow because they need to be pollinated. Um, so it's interesting that, that the coffee plant has, the caffeine attracts pollinators. Um, and at the same time, it's also a natural pesticide for insects that eat the plant. So it's, caffeine is a protective um, substance for the plant. So anyway, okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, health, um, is it healthy, yes or no? And I wanna start this out by saying that Anytime you're listening to anybody give you any kind of information about health, you need to keep in mind um, that anything, if you're going to start drinking coffee, if you're going to drink more coffee, you have to discuss anything, any information that anybody gives you with your healthcare professional to be sure that whatever you're planning to do with whatever information you get is appropriate for you, depending on your own condition and situation. So previously, as many of you are probably aware, um, there were a lot of health concerns about coffee. It was, um, let me say that it, there were several, the World Health Organization actually as, as recently as 1991, called it a possible, a possible carcinogen. Most of the studies that um, went with, along with the hazards of heart disease, stroke, type two diabetes, pancreatic cancer, and all the other things, um, apparently these studies did not control for smoking, which is, something because smoking and coffee drinking go along together in many many people and apparently it, it is now thought that first of all most of these a lot of these studies were found to be quote unquote fishing ex expeditions and not very robust research research and um didn't control as i said for smoking so now they've been sort of discredited and uh, the world health organization has taken coffee off the possible carcinogen list so the current thinking um is you know three to four eight ounce cups of coffee or about 400 milligrams of caffeine a day. It's been associated with reduced death rates. Um, and an and a epidemiological study of more than 200,000 participants who were followed up actually for 30 years, those who drank three to five cups of coffee a day with or without caffeine, and that's interested for the details of either drinking or decaf, were 15% less likely to die from all causes. Um, though you have to keep in mind that um, it, it can uh, interfere with sleep and depending on how quickly you metabolize it, you know, some people can drink coffee all day long and at night and still sleep. Um, and we talked about the polyphenols and antioxidants, which I'll talk about a little bit more that protect the cells from damage as much as they function or cells from damage as much as they protect the cells functions from damage. So what's good about it? So these are all these facts um, that you're about to hear have come from three sites and you can research them in more in depth or you can ask me questions. And if I don't know the answer, I'll be happy to check it out for you. But from the Johns Hopkins site, from the Harvard School of Public Health and Medicine blog and from the Cleveland Clinic, which is also very renowned and highly thought of in terms of its research. So. Taking these facts from those uh, sources, I feel very comfortable in, in um, sharing this with you. So multiple studies have shown that regular coffee consumption lowers the odds of developing type two diabetes. And that's true for uh, decaf as well. Now, these are not cause and effect studies. They're studies, they're epidemiological studies, which means they look at, at a, a large group of people and they see, look at trends, but they don't know specifically what about coffee actually causes this uh, beneficial health effect. In this particular instance, they have theorized, and I guess that's because they look at caffeine and the effect it might have on the body, that coffee helps you process glucose and sugar better. So that's a theory as to why um, regular coffee consumption lowers the odds of getting type two diabetes. With heart disease, um, it lowers the instance of heart disease in women. Uh, one to two cups per day may ward off heart failure due to a weakened heart. 
And also with stroke for women, one cup a day is associated with lower stroke risk. Um, and some of that might be due to the, uh, well, with at least with the weakened heart with the stimulating effect of the coffee. As far as neurological diseases, I found this um, pretty interesting that regular intake of coffee is linked to a lower risk of Alzheimer's, especially in women and less chance of developing Parkinson's disease. So there wasn't any indication of exactly why they thought that might happen. Again, I think that over time when they start doing more studies of, of caffeine and coffee itself and its effect on uh, specific uh, uh, conditions and how it affects chemically or um, physiologically or biochemically in the body, they, they might be able to come up with uh, more specific reasons why. So, um, also, uh, coffee seems to protect against liver cirrhosis in people at risk of cirrhosis or um, any other fatty liver disease or liver disorder. And research shows that coffee drinkers are more likely to have liver enzymes within normal ranges. Again, no indication of why they feel that this is true. This is just a epidemiological um, uh, research that they've done. And originally, as you know, they, there was a very big hue and cry that coffee was um, possibly a uh, cause for pancreatic cancer. The research didn't really prove that out. And um, in fact, coffee drinkers have a lower risk of liver cancer and um, colorectal cancer, uh, two of the leading causes of cancer in the world. Now, one possible mechanism here, they are hypothesizing again about a possible mechanism. And I, I'm assuming that there's some kind of research out there that at least gave them the idea that this might be true. That um, dark roast coffee, which is my favorite kind of coffee. I like very dark roast coffee, decreases breakage in DNA strands. This occurs naturally, but can also lead to cancer or tumors if, they, if they're not repaired by your cells. So it, it might affect the, the strength of the DNA which is sort of interesting. Um, and as I said, those studies performed more than 30 years ago suggested a potential link between coffee consumption and cancers of several different cancers. Current research has largely refuted that. And um, some of the older studies raised red flags about cancer link have since been used as examples, as I said, of fishing expeditions and weak research methodology. And this is one of the big um, problems with reading um, new, the news media with the news media publicizing, oh, we've got the cure for cancer, we've got the cure for this, we've got the cure for that. And maybe even what's led to some of the skepticism about what's going on with vaccinations now, I don't know. Part of the problem is you have to look at the studies and you have to trust the source of the studies. And if you do trust the source of the studies and it's a reputable source of the study, then you know, you're gonna have less likelihood of getting erroneous information a lot of these studies that were originally done that, that uh, the coffee was unhealthy were not robust, what they call robust. They weren't well designed and they didn't um, account for variables. And so they have been basically thrown out. Um, so depression, uh, several studies have found that the more coffee a person drinks, the lower their risk of depression. And again, this might have something to do with the stimulating effect um, and you know, just the all over. Uh, sense of well-being that you sometimes get from drinking coffee, though it can make you jittery if you drink too much. And in terms of longevity, uh, moderate coffee consumption, as I think I've said over the course of this of, of sharing these facts with you, three to four cups a day has been linked with longer lifespan, most likely due to the positive effects on some of the health issues that were listed above, because all of these things are major um, health issues in, in uh, our society. Um, so, much of a good thing? Are there still issues? Are there still possible problems with coffee? Well, yes. Um, whoops, I'll go back. I'm sorry. I didn't have the kid. Um, there was a 2016 report that um, the, the World Health Organization put out concerning drinking coffee that, it, that might link to esophageal cancer when you drink coffee or any beverage that is greater than 149 degrees Fahrenheit. It increases, increases the risk of irritation and ultimately uh, constant irritation which could cause esophageal uh, cancer. But that, as I said, it's not unique to coffee. And most of us don't drink coffee at such high temperatures. Um, it's unusual to find in the US according to what I read. Um, and with cardiovascular disease, uh, most we observed it with very high consumption, well above four cups a day. Um, they didn't account for smoking. So again, 
you know, you have to account for the variables, the other variables, the other health behaviors that people might be participating in who drank uh, for four, five, six, seven, eight cups of coffee a day. Um, it can be a cardiovascular, a cardiovascular disease risk on its own because of the temporary elevation in blood pressure and fast or abnormal heart rhythms. And this of course would be mostly true for people that have those, can have heart conditions and probably might have been told to stay away from coffee or at least to drink moderate amounts. Now, here's an interesting thing. And I know at Coffee Corral, I believe that they prepare their coffee through a paper filter. Um, unless you use a filter, there are things that you don't have, this is just a name I'm throwing out. There is a chemical substance called diterpenes, which um, increase the bad, the LDL, the low density lipoprotein cholesterol, unless you prepare the coffee with a filter. So boiled coffee or some of those little um, stove uh, espresso machines and things like that, uh, espresso in general that isn't, uh, doesn't make coffee through a filter could actually possibly raise cholesterol. Um, in a word about calf, I think I mentioned, it's not totally without its health benefits. And I think that, that I mentioned that throughout um, my, my uh, presentation um, because the same polyphenols that are in caffeinated coffee have, which have the same anti-inflammatory anti properties lower the risk of type two diabetes and cancer as well. So um, does anybody have any questions at this point, comments? Um, and if not, we'll, um, okay, we'll move on to um, next part. Um, and this is Eric Rollback, who is from, and I hope I pronounced that right, Eric, <laughs> um, who is, um, a co-owner and the master roaster at Coffee Corral. And he's gonna talk about other aspects of coffee uh, that I have not spoken to. So take it away, Eric. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanna say uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you guys for allowing me to come and talk. Um, I'll keep it brief, uh, but I just have basically a, a general overview uh, uh, regarding coffee. Uh, when you do think of coffee and coffee producing countries, it is broken down into three uh, global regions. You'll have uh, East Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, Southeast Asia, and then the rest of the Pacific, and then finally Latin America. Uh, each region, uh, similar to wine, uh, each, re each region has different soil types, different characteristics that go into the, the tree that will um, ultimately come out in the taste of the coffee. Uh, there are, uh, this is probably, if this is uh, basic knowledge for everyone, uh, I'm sorry guys, but there's just basically two major uh, types of coffee beans, uh, Arabica and Robusta. Um, every coffee house that you typically go to will always have Arabica beans. Uh, Robustas are not, um, they are very earthy. They are, they don't smell that great. Uh, they do have a very high caffeine content though. Uh, the uh, Arabica coffee is grown at elevation. The higher the elevation for the coffee, the more fruity or floral notes you get. Uh, and then the lower elevation would have a more earthy feel. Uh, so Roughly that line is uh, 3,500 feet. So uh, 3,500 feet, anything above that would be a very fruity floral. Anything below would be a little more earthy. Uh, so when you think about a coffee plant or a coffee tree, there are uh, thousands of uh, species of, of trees. Uh, but when you do plant one, uh, don't expect that you're gonna yield any fruit for about five years. And if you're expecting to plant a bunch of coffee trees to, to uh, support your, your personal coffee habit, or if you would like to get into the business of supporting multiple people's coffee habits, you better plant a lot of trees because each tree uh, will roughly yield one pound of roasted coffee per year. 
so if you think about that, uh, at Coffee Corral, we roast upwards of roughly a thousand pounds a week. So it's a uh, we have to source out a lot of coffee trees throughout the world to be able to uh, to get enough green beans to support the the local coffee addicts. Um, now, when you uh, when those five years are up and you're able to uh, get the fruit off the tree, uh, there's basically two major ways that you are able to. Uh, harvest those beans. They call it the, the natural way and then the washed way. So a natural way is just to have the uh, ripe cherries. Uh, they'll either dry on the on the tree or uh, they'll be taken off and, uh, and put on the ground before they're hulled. Uh, hulling is a, a term that basically is uh, it, you're removing the coffee bean from the cherry pot. A uh, little fun fact for everyone, uh, there's typically two beans in a cherry pod. Uh, if there's only one, it is called a Peabody. So if anybody likes a, a Peabody coffee, you're drinking coffee that only has uh, one coffee bean in the shell. Uh, so uh, the second type was a, so we had natural was the first, uh, and then the second type was washed. So this is uh, when the, uh, the coffee beans are separated from the cherries, they're submerged in water, and then they're dried on a, a large patio. Uh, so if anybody has uh, if, a large patio, meaning just that it could be either a brick patio, a concrete patio, and it's just right in the sun. So it's it, they're able to, to dry the beans. Uh, with that all being said, a nice little history of and uh, talking about the, the beans itself. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little more about the roasting process. Uh, so when you do get uh, beans in, green beans, as they're called, unroasted, uh, each bean has a, uh, a different characteristic going back to the initial uh, three global coffee regions. Uh, you can, uh, if you're well versed in coffee, you can kind of tell where the bean is from based on just looking at it. Uh, Coffee basically is roasted to a light, a medium, or a dark roast. I know Judy said she likes a, a dark roast, but I'm, I, I tend to go more of the light, medium roast. Uh, I feel that in the, uh, the light mediums is where you have a lot of your, your flavor, that fruity floral notes. The, the darker you go, it's, it's, uh, you're roasting out some of the floral. Um, one, uh, one idea or one uh, topic that always comes up, and it's, uh, it's, it's a myth that has been debunked, but people still believe, is that the light, uh, light coffee has more caffeine than a dark roast coffee. Uh, and that is, uh, it's not true to the point where it could be, yes, very minuscule, but uh, light, medium, or dark, it all has the same amount of caffeine. It's basically based on the origin. Um, but when you are roasting coffee, you are uh, very similar to when you're cooking or you're baking. What you're, you're trying not to do is I'm trying not to burn the coffee bean. I'm also trying not to bake it. So I don't want it to just sit and get hot. Uh, you wanna be able to, to take enough of the flavor, uh, find the flavor that you're looking for. So a lot of the times um, what you're, you're looking for is that first crack as they call it. First crack is when the moisture starts, uh, the, starts coming out of the, the bean. Uh, at that point is when it starts, we'll call it the development time. Uh, development time is like it, the, uh, like it states, is this is the time where the bean gets most of its flavor. So uh, this could be depending on the bean, anywhere from a minute to two minutes, but this is, uh, this is definitely uh, the further you go will make it a little darker 
and uh, at some point you'll reach a second crack uh, for your heavy dark roast, which is when the CO2 is escaping the beam. Uh, so that is roughly what I have for my roasting process. Judy, I'm gonna uh, go back to a point that you made regarding the, uh, the public houses and also the, uh, the Penny Universities or the, the coffee shops. Uh, one of the reasons why it was uh, such a taboo, well, when you think about it in the uh, late 1600s, 1700s, uh, everyone was drinking beer and everyone was having these thoughts when they were at the public house, they would share a bunch of stories. They would make plans for the other day or for, I'm sorry, for the next day. And uh, if anyone's been out drinking a, a time or two, then you know that these plans sometimes uh, go awry because the, the spirits take over and you kind of forget what you were talking about. Everyone and uh, during this time period, uh, late 16, early 1700s, the people at the coffee houses were the, the educated people where they were going and they weren't uh, drowning in the, the suds per se, where they're actually having educated conversations that they remembered. Uh, I think that was one of the, the major reasons why uh, coffee was a little taboo to start. Uh, but again, the coffee house has come full circle, as you said, Judy. Uh, we see it at Coffee Corral every day where uh, we always like to say we're little more than a, a coffee shop on the corner. Uh, we have people that uh, they love to come in and you'll, you'll have all walks of life. We get, uh, we, we get young kids, although eight to 80 is our, uh, our, our typical range. Uh, even though you come in sometimes and these young kids are asking for a cup of coffee and it's, uh, it's mind blowing, but they, they enjoy it. Uh, and we'll have people come sit, and uh, similar to the stories that Judy were telling, they'll come, they'll do their work, they'll have conversations, they'll conduct business. Uh, it is definitely a, a place for, for meetings. Uh, and it's, uh, it's definitely a place where people can come and share ideas in a, a, a safe and positive way. So, and then, so uh, uh, were you saying that it might be, um, what's the word I'm using for it? it might be a little bit, uh, the coffee houses became places that might have been a little bit, um, I, don't, I don't want to say troublemakers, but where they actually would challenge the status quo because they had these intellectual conversations or you'd say, I would say, I would say you're 100% correct on that. That's why it was taboo. I guess, I don't know why. Clement decided it was great. And by the way, we had one question. Um, what are Robusto beans used for if you mostly use Arabica in your roasting? Uh, so uh, a lot of the Robustas can be found in uh, some countries enjoy them for their espresso. Uh, some are used in blends of coffee. Uh, the Robusta beans are definitely a, uh, a cost efficient uh, bean. They are uh, much cheaper than the uh, Arabica beans. Uh, not to say that they are, uh, well, I would say that. Uh, I would say that they, uh, they do not taste as good. They are uh, definitely a more earthy, uh, a much more earthy pungent smell. Um, the Arabicas, they have been known to, uh, the Arabicas are always a, a higher quality versus the uh, not of, uh, of as high quality as a Robusto. So they would use the Robusto in um, say Turkish coffee or espresso because it had that um, more caffeine and it gave it, it most, most me I, I like espresso and, and Turkish coffee, but they tend to, they t they're bitter. So very bitter. Yeah. And coffee is inherently bitter. Okay. So if anyone's out there saying, oh, I don't like bitter coffee, well, coffee is inherently bitter. bitter right. Because maybe one of the reasons we just put so much stuff in it. <laughs> anyway. 
Um, did you want to speak at all to the to method that you use? Do you, I haven't been, I have to be honest, I haven't been in the coffee corral for a while, but I know you used to do the pour over. Yeah, do you we still, still do that? Do. Yes, we do. Yeah. And so uh, you're, so there, are, uh, there are a few different, uh, well, there's a, a many different brewing techniques. Uh, besides the, the quality of being uh, a, good, uh, a good grinder is definitely a, a worthwhile experience. Uh, just because you're able to take the coffee bean and, and really if you have a, a bean that is uh, fresh but you uh, don't think it's as fresh, you're able to adjust your setting and kind of get the most uh, flavor out of your coffee. But uh, what we do at Coffee Corral is, uh, is the pour over method. Uh, we'll also have a uh, drip pot, but uh, our coffees uh, will um, we'll take a, uh, we'll take the coffee beans, we'll grind them up and then we will heat, uh, we will wet down a, a coffee filter and then we will, uh, fill the filter with the coffee grinds and then run a 205 degree, uh, water temperature over the beans for a, a selected amount of time until the, uh, the cup of coffee is completed. Uh, this has been said that it produces the best flavor uh, with the most uh, promising uh, health benefits. Uh, people also will say that a French press is the best method. Uh, I can't say that one is better than the other. Uh, I enjoy the taste of coffee all around, but I can definitely tell when it's a, a drip pot versus a pour over. Uh, you can just definitely, it's, it's just, it has a little more flavor to it. It's, uh, you could definitely taste the freshness in the coffee. Could you speak to grinds, like what, how fine, how medium grind? I know that's a big, I don't know if it's a controversy, but a big issue for people. And it's something also, that we, it's something that we deal with every day at Coffee Corral where someone will have a bag of beans and I need a ground. Well, what kind of machine are you using? Mm -hmm. uh, because that's really the, the method of what, uh, of what grind you'll use. So, uh, if you think of a, uh, a clock, we'll go 12 o'clock is going to be a uh, regular old coffee pot. We'll call it an auto drip where it's your, your regular, your, your coffee pot, your, your Mr. Coffee. Uh, once you start going um, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock is when you start getting into the finer. Uh, fine is going to be used for a pour over where you want, when you're pouring the water over the coffee, you want the coffee to, the water to grip the beans, the, mm -hmm. the, the grinds a little bit, but still have enough to run through. Mm -hmm. uh, when you turn that dial even more to, to three, four, five, you get into the, uh, the uh, espresso and the Turkish grinds. So those are the extremely fine because you want that water, it's under a high pressure and you want that water to be able to, to come right through mm -hmm. uh, and, and right into the cup. Uh, once you go 12 o'clock when we're going the other way is when it starts becoming more coarse. Okay. That's when you find your, uh, your, your, your true drip machines. You'll find your, your percolators uh, and also your French, uh, your French press and we also uh, will use it for our uh, very coarse for our cold brew methods. Okay, okay. Could you speak to cold brew just a little bit? Yep, cold brew is uh, another one where we're always educating people on the differences of cold brew versus iced coffee. Uh, iced coffee would be a, a, a regular hot coffee that you brewed that, you, that got cooled down and is now poured over ice, a little higher uh, acidity content. Uh, the cold brew would be a method that used, uh, we use a, uh, a 12 to, uh, a 12 to, uh, 13, 14 hour process where we'll grind beans and, uh, add the water to the grinds and let it sit for again, 12 to 13, 14 hours, uh, lower acidity, 
uh, and it also uh, it, the lower acidity comes in from the uh, no heat. Uh, cold brew is, uh, is is very concentrated, uh, and you you definitely need to cut it before you consume it, or else your your stomach is not going to like you. Okay. Um. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share and now does anybody have any additional questions for either Eric or myself? Or are we winding, winding down? I mean, Eric, is there anything else you wanted to share? Or I, I would like to uh, point out that you, you have that outside area, which of course is not going to um, be as, as available in the winter, but there, there's a lot of just uh, mingling going on. And I don't know if people who sit out there and next year or next to the coffee corral, it, that to me was a thing that I thought was more like coffee houses because it's people congregating and talking and having discussions. And, and I thought it was, I, I think it's great that you did that. I, I really thought that that was an, an excellent addition to your uh, operation. So. Um, oh, well, well, thank you very much. It was definitely, uh, it, it came from the pandemic where uh, right. uh, the gift and the curse of Coffee Corral is that we're 600 square feet. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice small building filled with a lot of love, but uh, that can only go so far. Yeah. So we, uh, we were able to expand to use the, uh, use the property to its fullest extent and uh, put in uh, some seating areas. And again, going back to, to your point on the, the true traditional coffee houses, we've uh, seen it over the last year or two where people definitely come in and they're hosting meetings. We, we see doctors with uh, pharmaceutical reps. We see a lot of, uh, we see teachers. We see, uh, we've seen bachelorette parties. We've seen all these people come and to just to come and share the share the space, share ideas, uh, talk business. Um, it's definitely been a, a, a fruitful endeavor for not just Coffee Corral, but for the for the community itself. Uh, we've added uh, a community garden that we reached out to the primary school and the middle school to help plant and maintain. Uh, we added uh, murals on our uh, office slash garage uh, that was, um, again, with the primary and the middle school students to be able to, to help out. So uh, when it comes to community, we definitely, uh, again, I spend more time at Coffee Corral than I do my own house. So it's, uh, we're, we're in such a great community on that west side. Yeah. yeah. Anything we could do to help out to make it better is something that we're going to do. And I think that it's great because that's, I think, the original true essence of the coffee house, uh, which is now coming back in a lot of, and you're certainly, you know. Does anybody have any other questions, comments? No? Okay. If not, well, Eric, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for, um, for being here tonight. And, um, Next month, uh, we'll be talking about um, Native American foodways, and we'll have Claire Garland, who is um, head of the Sandhill Indian Association, talking about Native American foodways. For anybody that's interested, I'll be getting a fly around in a couple of weeks. So thank you, everybody, and have a good night. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, everyone. Okay.